2020. Yeah, so perfect timing. Well done. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, so you've got uh, this collection of essays, King Acid and other essays, and then uh, I've got my collection, which came out a little bit before mm -hmm. the pandemic. Mine was out in August of 2019. So I got a couple of months before everything kind of closed down. Um, but uh, no, that's great. Uh, do you want to read? You're going to read for a couple, a couple of your pieces, right? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to read uh, an excerpt. Uh, is it kind of some of them are kind of one? Okay. Um, so, oh wait, I did want to. Um, it's been uh, ten years, almost to the day, you know, almost a month that uh, we lost Chris Toll. You know, the little uh, sweet elfin uh, fellow that uh, was at uh, every one of my readings and. Uh, he was just everywhere. So I wanted to read uh, a poem from, uh, from uh, his uh, book. Uh, real quick, uh, Carbon-Based Life Form Blues. Art is religion, my higher self, lies on top of gray clouds and plays a harmonic. Oh yes, she cries some tears. Religion is philosophy. Why is Grimm and Pilgrim? And why isn't a pill? My liquor store dances in the rain. Philosophy is art. The job of poets is not to explain the mystery. The job of poets is to make the mystery greater. So good. You know, um, there's a miss him so much. local band, um, Lil Soup Choir, that's mm -hmm. translated a lot of his poems into the song. Yeah, that's awesome. So, definitely worth checking out as um, so, would you like to read a piece and then I read a piece and then you read a piece and I read a piece? Sounds good. Okay, let's do that. So, I'm going to read just an excerpt from King Acid. Oh, yeah, just uh, this, was, this takes place about a year after high school, so if there's mention of high school kids and high school girls, uh, that's why I don't want to freak anybody out. Uh, so, <clears throat> King Acid worked in a movie theater in Hoover, the Birmingham suburb where, where we lived. But we had to go a couple towns over to Homewood when The Matrix came out. His theater wasn't showing the movie, but it wouldn't have mattered because the place in Homewood had stadium seating, quite a novel concept at the time. King Acid figured that if we were going to experience this mindfuck of a movie, we should do it the right way. Our young friends, Gary and Colleen, still in high school, were coming along. Gary was a nice kid, 16, weird greasy bolt cut. He could drink like a fucking fish too. Good guy. We also had a car, a giant gas guzzler of an SUV. He also had a car. So it was also oh, practically used to have him around. King Acid didn't have his license and neither did I. Too poor for a car and who needs a hassle anymore? It was the middle of the week, a Wednesday maybe? King Ass and I were off work and Gary and Colleen were skipping school like they did a lot in those days to hang out with us for a while before we went to the movies. They came over mid-morning and King Ass had already eaten his lysergic breakfast. He walked in, they walked in the apartment and King Ass had shouted, follow the white rabbit. And saying that all morning, I said, as they walked in and took a seat on the couch and lit up a joint. King Ass had hated the pot paranoia and the stuff was prone to giving me panic attacks, but. Why not be gracious hosts? Soon afterward, King Acid was in the closet, clutching a hunting knife and talking to people only he could see. Shit, Gary said, he's really fucked up. And indeed he was. To make things worse, Benny, our main acid dealer, stopped by. Skinny little shit, Benny was like everyone else, in awe of King Acid. Benny, King Acid shouted from the closet. Get the fuck over here, Benny. Don't sell him any more acid, I said. <laughs> but it's hard to argue with somebody who has a giant knife and is threatening to stab you. Then he sold him a few hits. And yes, a stupid decision, but come nightfall, we were in the mostly empty movie theater parking lot, and as we got out of the vehicle and stretched, one of the cars started to go mad. Lights flashed, horns honked, the alarm had gone off, and seemingly on its own. King Acid crouched in the three-point stance and shouted, I am the Max, and ran across the parking lot toward the car. I eyed Gary, and he returned my glance for a second, both of us realizing that this maniac was going to attack some poor person's car. Then we took off after him. 
I was out of shape and chubby and Gary wasn't in great shape either, but we managed to get him just before he got to the car. We grabbed him in a bear hug. It was all very surreal. I didn't think, didn't think we were gonna be able to wrangle him. I am the Max, he shouted. I am the Max. It made sense he thought he was the Max. He recently gotten into the TV show. The whole thing was very hallucinatory, hallucinatory certainly. The protagonist, a superhero of sorts, wore a purple suit and thought he and he might or might not have been completely crazy. He was a homeless man who lived in a cardboard box. He might have been hallucinating his life as a hero in a mythical outback, or he might have actually had the power to travel through space and time. I am the Max, King asked, shouted, still trying to wriggle out of our grip. Colleen just now caught up with us. Jesus, she said, what the fuck? This is stupid, I said. We should just go back to the apartment. Fuck you, King asked, said. We're not going back. I am the Max. Gary let him go. I released my grip. You gonna be calm, Gary said. I am calm, King Acid said. Fine, Gary said. God damn it, we'll see the movie, but you gotta calm down, okay? I'm calm, I'm fucking calm. Then he barked at us, wildly, like a dog. Hey man, I said, let's smoke a cigarette. King Acid nodded wildly, then he barked some more. Jesus. We're gonna get our tickets, Gary said. We'll meet you inside. I concentrated on my cigarette. Inhale, exhale, inhale, calm. Once in the building, we walked past the concession stand and a pair of good-looking teenage girls passed us. They smiled at King Acid, his face a pretty sight for just about anyone, and he fucking barked at them. The girls quickened their pace on their way out of the theater. I told King Acid about the barking a few days later and he said, that's funny, I remember saying, hey, pretty ladies, and so it went. Gary and Colleen had the best seats in the house, the last row. The place was completely empty, an advantage when you're seeing a movie in the middle of the week while babysitting a frenetic lunatic. Yes, yes, so there were some previews and King Acid squirmed in the seat, impatient for the movie to start. I was impatient too, hoping the whole thing would be over soon and we could get the hell out of the public place and back to the apartment. Finally, after so many goddamn previews, the movie started. Suddenly the screen filled with vertical lines, computer code, all bright green and actually quite mesmerizing. King Acid stood up, stiff at attention, holding his arms out to either side. He was absorbing the Matrix's source code, taking it into his body, let it flow through him. Then he started to walk forward, as if he was actually going to walk through the screen and into the movie. Oh shit, Gary said. We both stood up, grabbed him just as he was about to trip over the seat in front of him and most likely topple onto his face. We struggled to wrestle him back into his seat. God damn it, I said, just sit. He reluctantly sat down. The movie rolled on and a few minutes later, a woman told Keanu Reeves' character that he needed to follow the white rabbit. King Acid pointed wildly at the screen. The white rabbit, he said, see? He was convinced the movie was speaking directly to him. The feeling of personal connection with the Matrix had weird repercussions a few days later. In the movie, characters are transported from the illusory, illusory world of the Matrix and back into the real world when they pick up a ringing telephone and hold it to their ear. Well, here we were leaving a Burger King, our bellies full of cheap food, walking through the parking lot in the hot Alabama sun, and a payphone started to ring, apparently for no reason. King Acid's eyes went wide. It's the Matrix, he said. He sprinted across the parking lot to answer the phone. I hurried after him. He was con I was convinced he'd finally cracked. When he picked up the phone and held the receiver to his ear, a look of severe disappointment spread across his face. No one there, he said, sullen, and hung the phone up. Okay, I'm gonna have to match that debauchery. A little debauchery of my own, it sounds like. All right, so this is from my little collection, Heretic and Housewife. Uh, yeah, this is about a debauched work trip that I end up on, you know, yeah. kind of out by accident. This is this is really a story in, in uh, I think, uh, making making do, making commitments to decisions that you're really not sure that you should have been making in the first place, up to and including working for the company that I was working for. So we go to do lunch in New Orleans. Oh, this is a piece called the Big T hyphen Easy, the Big T Z. So we go to lunch in New Orleans a place called Rick's, which I picked because of Casablanca. Turns out it's a strip club. Turns out it's a chain. 
I suggest it without realizing what it is. <laughs> they have food. So we went, in we go, boldly. I have a Manhattan, a sandwich, and another Manhattan. The doctor pays. He's been hitting on me the whole conference. The trouble is that he's incredibly normal, so I'm bewildered by what he could possibly see in me. He asked me, when you met me, what was your impression? And I said, I was at work. You were just like everyone else. I apparently need to complete a few more requirements before I get my slut merit badge. And so here we are, me and a neurologist, lunching in a Bourbon Street stripper bar. I say, look, you can sit here eating and look in that big mirror and you don't have to turn around chewing to watch the dancers. He says, no, but the real thing is so much better. I say, you're a neurologist, so you should know as well as anyone that whether you look directly at her or in the mirror, it's just a reflection on your retina. It's the same show, but without the social awkwardness of chewing. He says, but the real thing is so much better. And anyway, this is all just a tease. I say, but when the real thing goes bad, like it often does, don't you usually wish it had just stopped with the teasing? Isn't the real thing often just a letdown? Apparently I had a point. He says, I can't tell whether you're wild or boring. I say, I'm both, I'm wildly boring. He's not laughing, but I am. I don't think I live in the same reality as most people. Sometimes I wonder if I'm schizophrenic, I say. And he says, I have ADD and I'm not taking any medication for it. <laughs> I haven't read this in a while. <laughs> he says, I have ADD and I'm not taking any medication for it. And then he wonders what I studied in college. Philosophy and psychology. I'm kind of an epistemologist, which is about discovering the origins of knowledge. How do you know what you think you know? Now he's laughing, but I'm not. Then I tell him I'm a transsexual, and he says, I suspected that yesterday, which is bullshit because I know what it's like when someone is looking at me thinking I'm a hot blonde piece of ass, and when someone is clocking me as a tranny hot blonde piece of ass. Not that I'm merely bragging, it's just the difference between these two situations can be extreme. And he said, I can tell because you're not completely feminine, you know, like that woman on the stage. The woman in question is maybe six inches shorter than me, buck ass naked, much larger breasted, and in fairly good shape for being so skinny. She's folded completely in half, still standing. The music is mid to late 80s rock. Age wise, I apparently belong to the club's target demographic. I say, yeah, well, not all that many women are feminine like she is, oddly enough. He says, your face has the characteristics of both woman and man. I say, most people's do. He says, what kind of genitals do you have? And I say, that's an awfully personal question. He says, I know, but have you had an operation, a penis, or a vagina? And I say, it's not like that for me. We need to modify the lexicon before I can, I can accurately talk about what's between my legs. Okay, so maybe I now I am bragging. I say, think about intersex conditions, the clitoris, the penis, it's pretty much the same organ. And this is what you have to understand about me. He says, I want you to promise me something. And I say, I'm not promising you anything before you ask the question. He says, I want to see you naked. I say, that wasn't phrased in the form of a question. There's no promise there. I watched this amused stripper pull a fake lily through her G-string, alternately making it stand and wilt. She's very funny, probably my age or older. I tell him, I'm not going to be your freak show. No, he says, I'm interested. I've never seen a person like yourself. Maybe if I do this, I can start figuring out a way to send myself out to conferences and bestow accreditations upon doctors who are interested in seeing me naked, a peep show with lab coats and a catered buffet. We sit there a while more while we finish our drinks. Finally, I tell him I'm ready to go. So we head to his hotel room. Still in my work clothes, a pleated sand-colored khaki pant, company logo buttoned down, sweaty from the humid day, Perhaps if I had had stomach flu, I might have felt less attractive. In the elevator, he lights a cigar, and I point to the no smoking sign. He says, I'll pay the fine. I tell him I don't have any condoms. He says he doesn't either. I tell him this limits our options. In the room, I strip out of the dorky work uniform, slacks, shirt, socks, bra, undies. He's fascinated, staring, staying dressed. Well, I think he wants to see a naked transsexual, he's going to see a naked transsexual. I sit naked in his hotel chair. He sits on the bed across the room from me. 
we sit and talk a while about safe sex until suddenly he starts reinterpreting my body aloud. He says, you should work out and you would be much happier if you saved up $5,000 and got breast augmentation, as if it was just that easy. And I say, I bet you'd be a lot happier for me. He seems disappointed that my shrinky dink genitals are not more interesting. He leans back on his bed. Maybe he's had enough. I settle into the chair, make it as you please, and feeling better about it by the moment. He tells me I need to see a doctor about any potential feminized organs in case they are cancerous and that I should really get some surgeries. I thank him for the advice and I wish out loud for money to fall down from heaven. It never comes and neither do we. I get dressed, having fulfilled my free freak show duty. He asks me to call him later, which of course I don't do. I head back to my bed and breakfast to sink into my, big, my own big soft bed, owning my genitals, my breasts, my body, and I sleep comfortably knowing that letdowns really hurt most when the teasing convinces you that something imagined is actually real. I'm glad you read that. That was actually one of my favorites. Oh, um, this cover cool. Uh, Katie painted that. Yay. I really like it. Uh, I really like the fact that we're kind of, kind of together in this book, you know, in a lot of ways, actually. Uh, let's see. Yeah. This one's called The Memory Bowl. Something to do with loneliness, though I wish I knew. Memory, past, present, future, colliding from blink to blink, and it's true that we're all a bit like Billy Pilgrim, even my own mindfulness meditation teacher who tried so hard to live in the moment and experience the now and concentrate, concentrate. He meant well, but I think this life is a version of Slaughterhouse Five, like here we are projecting ourselves into the past and then an ideal future and maybe some present tense for variety. Everything's so familiar, discomfort with the whole thing brought to heel by humor as stupid as you will. Try, as Vonnegut said, to pick the best parts, but what do I know? Because my meditation teacher soothed us as he brought us deep into the present with a loving kindness meditation where we concentrated so hard, eyes closed, visualizing the person we loved. I thought about Katie, my wife and only companion, and it made me so happy to think about her and my love for her so intensely that I cried after the thing was over. Maybe there was something to this meditation thing, and it certainly did its trick, keeping me rather sane during a depressive period until the depression became too much and I ended up in the hospital emergency room talking to a crisis counselor. But I can't shake the feeling that we were never meant to live linear, non-linear until the big break, of course, and that's why my fingers type so fast. Sometimes it's tiny razor blades through blood vessels. Sometimes your travels make no sense, like when you're in line at the supermarket where you work and you look at a tabloid magazine and it you, reminds you somehow of the time you were in elementary school and you were in the bathroom with your friend Doug and the class bully Sean was there too. And you had told Doug in a stage whisper that Sean is an A-S-S hole, pronouncing each letter slowly, deliberately. And then Sean attacked you with punches and standing there in line waiting to pay for your groceries, you realize this is exactly what you wanted to provoke this giant bastard into throwing wild punches. And luckily you found out that punches to the face don't hurt very much when they're thrown willy nilly. And then you realize you're staring at a picture of Jennifer Lopez on a ma magazine cover and you think, what the fuck? And how did that face take you there? And reality suddenly becomes a series of bleeps from the barcode scanner on the cash register. Bleep, bleep, monotonous, and there you are again. But anyway, anywhere is better than those goddamn bleeps. When I was 10 years old, standing in the kitchen, having just finished helping put away my some groceries, I was momentarily ripped into a terrifying present tense, the thing in which my meditation teacher found so much value, though this was a dissociative nightmare. I stood in the kitchen and my little brother Dave, seven years old, walked through the garage door and into the kitchen and he suddenly didn't seem real. He seemed filtered, like someone on TV. I called out to him, desperate, are you real? And he laughed and said, of course, what the heck? But I wasn't so sure. Was this someone fictional I was talking to, like a character on my Saturday morning cartoons, or was he my brother? Indeed, it shook me that I might never know the difference. I'd become detached, and it frightened me. This was present tense as it mo at its most raw. Everything peeled away, but I decided for now to accept that I wasn't the only thing that existed in the universe, or rather, everything in the universe wasn't some part of my imagination. 
But the panic of the present tense was too much. Andrew Light, Asset King of Southbrook Apartments in Hoover, Alabama, had a freak out in the memory of his father and his father's fears and the shock of being alive and drinking it all away was suddenly too much and his mind split down the middle. I was 18 and he was 17, not quite adults and something a little more than kids. His sanity was always on edge, but then the break came when he drank too much and blacked out and myself and my brother Dave followed him as he weaved around the parking lot and I should have realized the seriousness of the thing, but nothing was serious back then. And so his eyes wide and dodging fake bullets in the Southbrook, Southbrook Apartments parking lot in the sweaty Alabama summer night. It was 11 or midnight and his short muscular body was illuminated in parking lot lights as he jumped behind a car and said, fucking get down, it's Charlie. We were leaving ourselves exposed to enemy fire standing there like that. And then he saw my ex-girlfriend Angie's apartment where she lived with her little brother and her mother and Andrew banged on the door because some part of his mind knew that within was sanctuary, but he was still going on about the bullets and how Charlie was shooting at us. When Angie, Angie finally opened the door to see what was going on, Andrew looked around, back stiff against the brick wall of the building, hyperventilating. He had no idea how he got there. He was coming down from his illusion and he barely believed me when I told him what happened. But he believed. Poor, sweet, hurt, young Andrew. His father, not the stepfather who made a hobby of alternating between beating him and telling him how Christ was love and did he really want an eternity of damnation, had been on the front in Vietnam and suffered from PTSD and disappeared from Andrew's life shortly before he was born in 1981. And so back against the wall in that shitty apartment complex, coming down from terrible visions, Angie told him to come inside, and so he went in. No more living his father's nightmare for now, at least. The memory blinked, then fizzled out. In 2009, I bought a new Macintosh computer. I'd given up using Macs more than a decade before, primarily because I needed Windows to do the work I was doing across platform issues were extreme then. And so for years I used Windows, and it was during that time that I discovered the MP3. This seemed like eons before Napster came along, because in those days time was plentiful. I began to collect MP3s to transfer to my ever more vast CD collection into exciting digital files, convenient digital files. It felt so naughty to do so. There were constant reminders that even though I was actually just backing up my library with degraded sound files, what I was doing was legally gray. Now, of course, it is common practice. I wound up filling hard disk after hard disk with files. I started burning CDRs with my collections and quickly became grumpy that I would never be able to afford a drive large enough to keep the whole collection in one place, accessible at all times. I bought the Mac because I wanted to stop worrying about the many complications Windows presented. I really resent the epistemology of Windows. I've always found it non-intuitive and unpleasant and slow, and the magnitude of the music on my hard drive did not help the speed of my stuttering Dell laptop. So I began to transfer my meticulously organized library by the flash drive load from my laptop to this sleek new Mac, and with each load I dumped the contents and imagined that my battle-weary computer might feel a little relief, a little relief and get the kick back in her step. It was about halfway through the transfer that I made the horrible discovery that I had been allowing my Mac to operate in its default mode, which meant that every time I dragged a music folder over from the flash drive to the hard drive, it overwrote the directory rather than merging the files in the folders with their prior contents, the way the Windows machine had always done. I was minding my P's and Q's when I discovered the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, and O no longer existed. What had I done? What had I lost? I researched solutions and things took a turn for the insidious. It turns out that the data wasn't even really erased from the directories when the directories were overwritten. The data was still all filling up space on the drive. What was gone was the identifying structure. The songs were there, but their titles and their artists and their album titles were now forgotten. 
There was software available claiming to be able to solve this problem, but I was in no position to pay that kind of price, especially since I doubted the veracity of this software's claims. I worked in an arts nonprofit. I didn't have that kind of money to throw around. Plus, most of my library was still archived in gleaming stacks of CDRs, and although I had purged two thirds of my music library nearly a decade prior, I still had a full wall of audio CDs on display. And so I started the long journey of rebuilding my library, disc by disc, making meticulous backups and filling backup drives, a 500 gigabyte drive that looked like a whiskey flask, then a one terabyte drive that looked like a pack of cigarettes, and ultimately a four terabyte drive that looks like an inflatable boat. And it was early in 2016 that I finally finished reorganizing my library when it began to feel like it was complete and accessible. I realized there were hundreds of hours of music by artists whose names I couldn't recognize, tracks and albums I had acquired in my travels, from shows I had forgotten I attended, and the shared libraries of friends to South by Southwest samplers and Soul Seek adventure sprees. Surely, even though I had created a whole separate directory for archiving triggering media, such as Ted Nugent's shockingly stupid song, Change My Sex, there were things in this wild unknown folder I wouldn't want to pop up on my iTunes at my New Year's party. So, into the wild unknown I go, loading up my iPhone with the unrecognized, and for most of that year, I found myself listening to ex exclusively to an exasperatingly random selection of songs with the intent of deleting what I never needed to hear again. I'd be doing the dishes, listening to a Chopin nocturne decompose into some long abandoned teenage bedroom band covering a post violator Depeche Mode song. And then there would be a 60 second fit of guttural screaming from a man who couldn't possibly be that angry about anything. <laughs> the, delightful, the delightful discoveries ultimately did not outrank the jagged feeling of, that this listening experience provided. After almost a year, a year of listening only to this unfamiliar music, I really yearned to get back to the music I had already selected for myself and put into meticulous order that I had taken so many years to collect and then recollect again. And so I merged the wild unknown with my known library, called it complete, and as I did so, was presented with a summary figure that I had never considered, that it was likely that I would never live so long as to listen to each song on this drive just, just once more. I, read, I remain ambiguous about my longevity. I do not feel especially old, but still, my body, like my music library, is a finite quantity. I think about it every minute I have left is more and more precious. Eventually, my time will come. Eventually, I will be overwritten. Eventually, my name will be detached and forgotten. I'm unsurprised. Most of my favorite people in history wait around in obscurity, and I am content to wait among them, although my heart still crumples when I consider how many people to whom I feel a debt of gratitude have died in abjection, impoverishment, and loneliness. I do my best to remember their names and occasionally check that the links are still live, hoping beyond hope that the software still works. So, what was it like to put out a collection right before Penn? You did, why, why do you write essays? Um, I don't know, I just had a few uh years where I just felt like I needed to get the stuff out. Yeah. And I don't really write them. I haven't written an essay for a while. Yeah. Um, I actually started a while ago, but it turned into a, 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 a experimental fiction piece. Mm -hmm. I don't really, in my stories, I'm not that active a participant. Uh -huh. I'm more of an observer and I, you know, kind of wary in my middle age of, um, you know, putting my friend's stuff out there mm -hmm. when I didn't ask permission, really, and some of it's really dark and personal, and, mm -hmm. you know, I, uh, this kind of stuff will turn into fiction, I think. Sure, yeah. sure. So, um, you do a really, uh, great job of, uh, sort of putting yourself in the center of stories, even when, uh, um, and even, um, there is sort of compassionately sort of or anonymizing the people in your, uh, in your stuff, uh, even if they, they don't necessarily deserve it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, you know, I, I mean, that is, the, I think, the danger of writing, um, you know, writing nonfiction is that, you know, there are always going to be other people involved. 
and how you negotiate that is so, um, I mean, it's so personal to like to your voice and, and I think what you want to get out of that. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think it's easy for me to, to put myself at the center of the stories because I am kind of an ego, egomaniac. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I think I love that. But, um, but yeah, like it, it, in, some, in some ways I think that um, it doesn't really, I mean, I think you've, you've, you've been sort of anonymized your lead character in King Acid, right? You've got yeah, this, I like, mean, I've changed his name. But, um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I change his name. And, mm -hmm. uh, he appears in different, kind of makes cameo appearances throughout the, throughout the book. book. So and still, I use different kind of names. Piece, his book. Yeah. Um, but he's changed so much that um, I kind of feel bad about writing about his past. I mean, he's, um, he got sober and um, he, uh, he's a uh, yoga instructor and just like really positive, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, kind of his stuff when I uh, knew him uh, is kind of fun to write about and kind yeah. of funny and, you know, and, um, Sort of profoundly sad at the same mm -hmm. time, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah, it sounds like you're really observing. You know, you're observing that transformation, and 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 wanting to talk about that. So I guess uh, if you, I haven't gotten to read the whole book, obviously. Uh, how many essays are in this? Um, more than ten, but okay. less than fifteen. Okay, somewhere in there. Yeah. And so he pops up as a character from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that this is, uh, would you say that this book is really about that journey for you're observing this, this, this person's journey through their, what, their whatever, whatever's driving them to be this wild man? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess a lot of it's about, you know, why do I enjoy, you know, watching this or why, uh, you know, trying to understand it because obviously he's um, rather extroverted right, right, <laughs> and right, I'm right. incredibly introverted. Um, so this kind of, he always fascinated me. Uh -huh. We became best friends and so like, I always had something, something uh, terrible to do, you yeah. know, in adventures. And you're a filmmaker as well. Do you see a link between your observational position in this in this collection and the ways that you're making uh, film and video work? Not right now. Um, yeah. I'm mostly doing music videos and stuff. Okay. And getting as abstract as I can. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about? I mean, you uh, do uh, uh, video and I do. all sorts of stuff I too. I do. I do. Um, does that affect your writing in any way? You know, it's it does inform. You know, there is a, a cross dialogue for sure. Um, sometimes more obvious than others. I think that uh, I think for a long time I really considered myself more of a collagist, kind of kind of across all the disciplines that I work in. Mm -hmm. You know, so I've made a lot of collage videos, and um, I, I mean, even even with you know putting together this collection of essays, it was kind of a collage process. You know, when I got the opportunity to submit um, submit a manuscript for uh, for this to make this chapbook. Um, you know, I hadn't really intended to start to, to make a book that year. <laughs> but you know, this opportunity came and I'm like, well, I can kind of like collage these essays, the, the, these extant essays that had either been published or performed elsewhere into what felt like a really singular narrative that it really seemed like there was a through line to it. Um, that I was able to see, and you know, I was like, well, hopefully other readers will, will be able to see this. I mean, it, it worked enough for the for it to win the chapbook contest yeah. and get published. So, you know, yay! Yeah, no, it's excellent. <laughs> um, did you see like a through line uh, building as you were putting your collection together? How did what was your process of making that happen? Um, I had kind of like uh, been uh, uh, thinking about a collection from from the start. 
but it took me 10 years off and on to get all this uh, material together. Mm -hmm. But as I finished an essay, I had the master uh, sort of sheet, the uh, master program for um, the book. Uh -huh. So as I finished one, I would put it where it would go in the book. Uh -huh. you know? That's cool, that's cool. So you really had it like charted out. Yeah, so I, mean, I guess I'm just anal yeah. about stuff, so. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> right. no, that's, really, that's really great, that's, uh, that's exciting. So. Yeah, I guess it came together like that. I mean, mm -hmm. no, not a whole lot of conscious thought, just sort of how it felt, you know, yeah. it, it, should, it should go. Yeah. So, yeah, so you put this out February 2020, mm -hmm. and everything was just like round to a halt, which must have been a little bit dispiriting. Yeah. It was like, I mean, it was, if the pandemic was nothing else, a real momentum killer. Yeah. You know, for, yeah. for certainly it was for me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and it's left me and kind of, you know, I mean, I'm a performing artist, you know, what, what, what do I do now? What, what, what is performance now? Like a lot of these kinds of questions that come up. I use the word epistemology a lot in my book, you know, but like it really gets to that like, base, uh, those base questions, you know, like what am I as an artist now? And um, I'm, I'm still not 100% clear that I've answered that question and it's like, I hesitate to say the word post-pandemic, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, post-ish, whatever, you know, it's, it's in the midst of, in the midst of what is still a pandemic, obviously. Um, how have you been negotiating that? You know, have you, have you, have you felt like an existential crisis like I have? Yes, yeah, yeah, actually, um, that's why I got back in, well, one of the reasons I got back into my, my video work, um, mm -hmm. Because it just broke my heart when um, I uh, couldn't go out and uh, promote this book, and you know I wanted to sort of just forget about it during the pandemic, mm -hmm. and not just sort of forget about writing, and just get into back into a whole new sort of much more abstract mode. Yeah. Um, just yeah, I didn't even think I would come back to it. I was just so so heartbroken, but right. well, I was right. like, uh, yeah, you got all these books sitting there. <laughs> yeah. yeah got to get rid of them. Yeah. Yeah, well, well hopefully we'll move a few, right? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else, uh, what, what other, can you give me like a, a quick trip through some of the other essays that you've written in this? Yeah, um, a lot of it's really dark. Um, it's, uh, a lot of it revolves around a um, group of kids that um, I sort of gravitated toward. Um, when I was in high school and a little bit beyond there, who, mm -hmm. um, um, I guess you could call Billy like trash if you wanted to. Um, I, I uh, feel like I could put myself in that category, so mm -hmm. I, I feel like uh, you know it's appropriate for my for my group. Um, but um, just just sort of the. Sort of observing people who are having these very raw experiences because they have very little or no hope, mm -hmm. you know, beyond what they have, beyond you know, maybe, yeah, you know, getting a decent job and you know, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I've always, uh, I've always found it. Uh, fascinating um, people who are sort of little outsiders yeah know, even um, you know people who, who might not think of that way right 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 but yeah it's just uh, it just fascinated me yeah you know. yeah I always wanted to write about them mm -hmm. because, you know, um, people should, you know, I mean, people should write about the, the very poor and very desperate. You right. Know, to, to, uh, get written about very much, especially from a first person perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I came from pretty, let's just say, humble background yeah. as well. And I think that it's, it can be a little fraught because you know I think that uh, certainly um, you know 
I have a hard time writing about my immediate family for some of these, some of the reasons you've already articulated, which are, you know, I don't really want to shame anybody or embarrass anybody, but at the same time, like, I think that it's, um, I mean, like, whatever, there's this, like, American-ish desire for redemption, right? Like, oh, you know, I grew up, I grew up in poverty, and now everything's middle class or great or whatever. It's like yeah. kind of like the, the 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 redemption, the economic redemption arc that a lot of uh, people seem to be pursuing. The happy um, ending kind of. Or you know, yeah, something like that. And like, I mean, I feel like I could definitely do these pandery sorts of. I could be writing pandery stories there. Um, I could also be writing ones that are just more like kind of bleak and um, you know whatever harmony Corinne ish, you know. And I'm not really interested in doing either one of them. Like, like how do you hit that like sweet spot in the middle where you can really talk about um, just the, how hard it is to be living in poverty and like you're saying, with, like real no clear sense of hope, and then you know because it would. I'm going to assume that there's a certain aspect of your, of your collection here which is about like, well, I'm observing all of this and, uh, and I'm coming through to this other place, um, you know, which what happens to people. Well, you were in Baltimore for a while and then you, you're yeah, you engaged um, in Baltimore's literary community for a while years. and then yeah. you moved away to Frederick? Yeah. I love Baltimore. I love Baltimore. It's my favorite city. It's a good one. By a, by a by a big stretch. Yeah. Uh, not that I don't like living in Frederick. It's, just, it's much more quiet. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have um, police helicopters uh, circling our okay. apartment, uh, you know, every other night. So yeah. That's uh, that aids the quietness. We have a new cool thing this year where the police helicopters are flying around telling people to get out of the pool. We, have, we can't afford <laughs> we can't afford lifeguards in the city now, but we do we can't afford police to. Fly around the, the city pools and tell people to get out. So, <laughs> you know that's a perk. That's a perk of urban living. <laughs> um, so, uh, so what's next? You've got the you got this out. Hopefully, you will sell some tonight, and maybe you'll do a, a little bit more, do a few more book events, right? Get them yeah. out of your house, right? Bit, that's yeah. the whole goal. Um, yeah, kind of turning away from prose writing at the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do like um, a lot of different things. Do you like um, find yourself doing uh, a bunch of writing for say like a year or something and then switch over to something else or you, are you, can you go back and forth and to different uh, modes of uh, yeah. expression? I do a lot of back and forth. I mean, I think it's whatever I'm in the mood to do on that particular day. Um, or, you know, if, if I've got like a project-based kind of thing. You know, I just finished, um, I just finished an MFA in uh, Intermedia and Digital Arts and uh, spent basically three years of trying to like, bring together a lot of the threads that, of the, the various disciplines that I work in, performance and video and writing and uh, music and all these, these sorts of things. And, um, you know, I hit a lot of those notes during, during my thesis project and then emerging from that, like I was talking about that like existential crisis of like what kind of artist am I? Am I going to be now? Um, you know, moving into some other uh, into some other directions, but it all kind of informs each other. You know, um, you know, I've, I've had a rock band for the past yeah, few right. years, uh, Sandra Labrada, where I've been really um, using that as a platform to write about a lot of frustrations mm -hmm. and anger and um, you know, uh, talking back to certain. Uh, either individual actual people or kind of amalgamations of, of uh, uh, people that need to be responded to in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. um, and so that has turned into a place, that had turned into a place where I can really talk about some things that I was having a hard time writing about yeah. in essay form, yeah. you know. Um, I have, I mean, this is the most extreme example, I think, but, you know, there is a song on, on our album which is, directly addressing uh, religious childhood sexual abuse, which I experienced. And, uh, you know, that was one of those situations where, you know, even though I wanted to write about this and I wanted to write the essays about it, I'm like, I'm not really interested in like naming names. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm certainly not interested in getting into any litigation around the whole thing. Um, 
And, uh, but I really wanted to get at like the heart of like what this did to me yeah. and, yeah. Uh, you know, and speak to that, you know, and yeah. it was just, once I recognized like, oh, I can, I've got this, this platform with this band where I can talk about this and speak about it from the first yeah. person without having to like name the dude yeah. You know? and, yeah. uh, and, 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 and make a successful piece of art out of it that like exercises some of those yeah. humans. Because I feel like this, is, I mean, I would imagine that this is some of what you've been working with with this book as well, which is like you've got these like things that you're trying to figure out yeah. and that you're trying to like talk about um, that maybe they've been sitting with you for 10, 15, 20, however many years. And, uh, Putting them in book form kind of gets them out and yeah. fixes them in a form mm -hmm. that you can, you know, then move on and do something else with an artist. That's absolutely my approach as an artist. Yeah, I think that's where I am. Not with music, too. Mm -hmm. I just want to. Uh, I don't want to be so straightforward about experiences anymore. I want to get more sort of into the emotional yeah. depth of things without. Being so specific. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I get that. I get that. I mean, you. you Are there any times where you just don't want to do something, like don't want to write, or you don't want to do that? Oh, all the time. Like, all the time. Especially when I had to write my thesis. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do that at all. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, ah. <laughs> but you know, TikTok. It was like you got to force this out. You know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, sometimes there's deadlines that uh, are external that help drive a project to conclusion. Um, but yeah, all the time where I'm just like, I just, I don't want to deal with that. I don't think about it. I don't want to, you know, even though I would, I mean, you know, it's, it goes back to that famous, uh, the famous uh, quip that's often been attributed to Dorothy Proctor mm -hmm. and many other people. Um, I love, I don't like writing, but I love having written. <laughs> right, mm -hmm. um, you know, I like having I like having them out. But even you know, a collection like this, mm -hmm. um, I feel so distant from so much of it. You know, now and I mean, now this book this book has been out three years. A lot of the essays are. I mean, the New Orleans essay I wrote in two thousand three, so that's twenty years old at this point, right? Um, so you know, it's, it's interesting to kind of revisit a past version of myself and, you know, and some of these things and, you know, to feel that kind of, that kind of distance and think about like how I, how I've shifted since that time. So it'll be interesting, I'm sure, with your book, like how, how you feel about it in five years, 10 years, 20 years, right? When you write these sort of, do you, um, can you write the first draft uh, quickly or do you sweat over uh, the details or? Usually, once I, I, it tends to pour out, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, I'll go back over and nitpick and worry about word choice and you know that kind of thing. But like I, I have definitely been known to just publish first drafts. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Okay. Pretty pretty frequently. So, yeah. um, you know, because uh, in some ways I think. Of myself as a performer when it comes to writing as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did a zine a long time ago where um, it was a comics zine. I'm not really a, uh, I'm not really that great at drawing. I never really aspired to be. Um, and I made this comic zine because I wanted to tell this particular story. And I saw that whole process as a performance in many ways that ended with a zine that I could then like distribute to people. Right? This this thing, but like. I didn't like really storyboard it out ahead of time. It was just like I'm on the the light rail mm -hmm. and like writing this thing out and like well, how, what's the next thing that these characters are going to say? Now I'm going to draw a panel and you know made, made the zine in that particular way. Um, I so. really admire <laughs> I really admire people who can do that. Um, my first draft was always the vomit draft. You mm -hmm. know, just everything's everywhere all at once and um, you know. I have to um, get it down as fast as possible yeah. and then uh, get down to, I do like uh, eight, ten drafts of everything I do just because, mm -hmm. you know, well, imposter syndrome really. Right, <laughs> but, right, um, right. Yeah. 
but I, I would love to have clean coffee in the first mm -hmm. draft. Yeah. I'm not going to say it's clean coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I will not go that far. It's but like uh, like Anne Lamont said in uh, Bird by Bird. But, uh, uh, she uh, uh, when she's writing a first draft, she's like, I hope I don't die and people look at this and think this is, you know, how I actually write. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I suddenly went mad at the end of. Uh, my life. Oh, yeah. writing gibberish. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, I definitely feel that. I mean, especially in my early years, I would just like regularly take trips down to the park with all of my drafts and I'd just burn them in the, you know, the, the grills. You know, set them on fire. Burn them. You know, get rid of them. Oh, okay. Because, yeah, <laughs> you know, like, I don't want anybody pawing through this. You know, my, my, my archivist pawing through these drafts. No, it's terrible. Want them to go away. I haven't done that in a while. I should do it again. I love a fire. Don't give me sweaty palms. <laughs> thinking about, about destroying anything <laughs> like that. It's uh, fun. It, it can be fun. You I can bury the Everything. Yeah. I never go back to it, but I keep everything mm -hmm. in a uh, in a physical copy. Uh, um, Katie knows how overflowing uh, stuff gets with uh, paper. Just. You have boxes, <laughs> boxes of just paper. Yeah. Should we see if there's any questions from oh, yeah, the audience? Yeah, please. Do we have any audience questions? What did you uh, feel you learned most about yourself as a Um. I learned a lot about uh, what I need to work on <laughs> about myself, you know. I'm not, uh, not necessarily the most introspective person. Um, and so like really working through these essays, you know. Um, and I also learned, um, you know, that I, write a bit too dark sometimes, you know, I do uh, do my best to put a little humor in there, because some of this stuff is just like really bleak, and um, uh, I feel like uh, I'm writing with a, with a hammer sometimes, just like pounding and pounding and pounding, and just very, very angry, and um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think my I do a lot of writing to figure out things about me. You know, I think that uh, yeah, I think that I sometimes write just to figure out what I think about a thing. You know, or I'll like one thing I, re I recognized though a long time ago when I fired my first therapist, um, <laughs> and because I'm like I can just walk around and talk into a handheld tape recorder, and it's like the same thing because like that that. So much, so much of therapy was saying something and then hearing yourself say that and wonder if you really think that, right? Is that really what I think? Is that, huh, maybe, you know, because like, and, and the great therapist would be able to push that back right, and ask that direct question, like, is that really what you think? Really, really. And, um, you know, that's why I realized I could fire that therapist and start saving some money. It's like, oh, I think I think we've I figured out this tool. Like, I just need to hear myself say the most insane shit that I've ever said and sit with that, you know. And like, okay, maybe I should scale that back or tweak this in you know another in another way. And so, in a lot of ways, especially when I'm writing nonfiction, it's really to see what I think, you know. Um, I mean, my New Orleans story is very much like, I think one of those, it was about a situation that, I mean, I realized I was getting myself in a bad situation really, really early, and yet I just kind of went along with it to see where this was gonna go. I mean, that could have been terribly for me. <laughs> it did, you know, it didn't. Um, and, you know, and, and like, and I definitely wonder like what the other person's story of that night is, or that day is, you know. Um, probably not told as well. Yeah, probably not. Probably not. It's like, oh, we were training. And you didn't really <laughs> think about it at all. It yeah. probably wasn't. Yeah. So, but yeah, I really feel like it's it's really a, you know, I mean, 
I think this is the thing that, that is, is kind of tying our collections together here is this like process of discovery in the writing that's that's in the play at play here. Within an essay? Or within each of your collections. Oh, okay. Yeah. So which does you can start with how you start with it. Well, with my book, I wanted the first uh, essay to come first, and then just everything else, I just kind of went on feeling you know, what, felt, uh, what felt right. Uh, you don't want to put two like incredibly depressing essays together. You want to <laughs> put something in between and make you a little more light. That's about it. I just, um, like I said, I was I put it uh, put the manuscript together over like ten years uh, as I was writing it. So I had to had a document and just copy and, and paste it when it's done. Mm -hmm. So you knew from the very beginning that you were going to make this a collection of essays, and that I wouldn't have started if I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> if I didn't have like a book or a bigger thing in mind. Yeah, that's so interesting. Even if I'm writing short stories, I, I know, you know someday I'm going to make a short story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be interesting to see, yeah, see how you transform this into the rest of the work that you do. Right? I mean, I feel like I, I write the same thing. I write the same essay over and over again in many ways. You know, I feel like um, I touch on a lot of themes. I, I bring up topics again and again and again. I mean, Writers do this, they're right? you know, obsessed about a particular thing over a period of time, sometimes your whole lifetime. Um, and I think that's what really like made my book hang together, you know, is that like I'm like, well, I'm I'm the central character in all of this. And uh, you know, um, sometimes I'm just like, you know, arrogant and political and I know everything, and um, that's the thing that makes the essay hang together. And then uh, you know, the very next essay is like, oh well, I'm kind of bubbling through this whole thing and trying to hold on to this like political self at the same time that I'm, you know, at lunch in a strip club. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, like I just, I, I mean, for me it was, it was much more accidental that my collection even existed, you know, much less, you know, hung together as, as, a, as a piece. But ultimately I feel like this, uh, I think my book ultimately becomes Kind of this internal biography that feels very accurate and actually in many ways complete you know like I think there's a real journey through my psyche in here um, that uh, you know for better or worse like tells you who I am you know uh, do you feel like that's the same for yours um, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> leave it to the critics I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> I just, I just go with the flow, yeah. man. You know, just yeah. see what, see what comes out. And, uh, yeah. Cool. I'm sure. Um, I'm sure I'm gonna have the same thing over and over yeah. too. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. No, but you and then. Uh, how do you think of endings, either for individual essays or for the collection? Mm. Sometimes it just happens, you know, and then sometimes I really struggle with that. Like, how is this going to end? Like, what what is the end of this? Like, what what have I learned from this? Um, you know, sometimes sometimes it's also a little too neat where I'm just like, oh, now I'm just going to like come up with a florid ending and, you know, is this really what I wanted to, you know, <laughs> or do I want to end it this, like, um, in this flowery kind of a way? Uh, like, I do feel like that last essay I, I read has a little bit of that floweriness, you know, to it. Um, but at the same time, it's, uh, you know, I think that that was really the point um, of that, that experience for me is like, I'm recognizing my mortality in the form of this like 
consumable thing that I've been like obsessed with my entire life, you know, my music collection. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just weird to kind of see your mortality in it. So like in so many ways, it's like, I mean, I didn't want to just be like so bleak about it and be like, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna die and then I'm gonna have these like, dusty hard drives. Like, oh, it's terrible. But, um, you know, but who amongst, who, who amongst us is it ultimately, right? Oh, endings. Um, yeah, it's a lot easier for me to write endings of nonfiction, even though my stuff tends to uh, be nonlinear. Um, so I'll just keep going till I feel like it's over, and then um, the uh, everything uh, has to lead up to that last. I believe in a, in a big last sentence, you know. So everything needs to. to lead up to that and there's stuff to that um, that's more the more concern really the uh, the rhythm of the thing the motion of the thing than not necessarily tying everything up so that makes uh, endings a lot easier too do you find it easier to write endings than the beginnings no, not at all really <laughs> no so like I said, I got to make everything um, lead up to that that last sentence. You know? mm -hmm. so, and that's uh, hard to do sometimes. But uh, yeah. um, no, do you ever work with the ending uh, in mind and then go from the beginning to the to that ending? Or? Probably. Hmm. That's a good question. I have to think about the next time I start writing something. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I. I don't know if I have like a. I, I'll talk to my therapist. I'm sure they'll be able to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a question? For me? As creative, as creatively multifaceted as you both are, are there any sort of outlets or media that you haven't really gotten into that you would like to try sometime, mm. even if it's like your TV thing only? I uh, tried to learn how to draw. Uh, I'm not very good because my fine motor skills aren't, aren't, aren't very good. Um, I did write a comic book and uh, I had an artist uh, illustrate it. Um, but God, if I could do everything on my own comic book, that would be wonderful. But it's not going to happen. <laughs> I can't really, I, yeah, I can't really say that there's anything that I would want to do that I haven't done yet, you know. I mean, I've tried a lot of things that, and things that just didn't really resonate for me. In grad school, I had to do, like, 3D animation and all this, you know, like, I was like, you know, I got really tired of that really, really quickly. And that's kind of the way that it is for a lot of media that, you know, if, if I don't really, like, snap on it, you know, like, oh, I just, it's too much work. Mm -hmm. 3D animation, too much work, come on. You can spend hours and hours and hours in front of that computer and make one little thing happen. Um, I like speedier, you know. Um, but I will say that um, I'm shifting, you know, I'm shifting a little bit musically, uh, and, and, and I don't know where I'm going with this quite yet, um, but uh, I just kind of want to break out of, of um, my typical three chord musical cycles, right? And uh, just put, uh, put a, a song on a compilation that's going to be forthcoming later this year. Uh, of, uh, they're all 60 second songs, all the songs on this compilation. It's a Baltimore based mm. uh, compilation called Pinch. And um, uh, I had had this song fried kicking around for a very long time and realized with a 60 second time limit, that song can be done. But what do I want to do with it? And uh, I ended up, the, the, the backing track, the musical track behind my vocal is uh, Brood X, Cicadas, and Frogs, like just field recordings, right? And so they're not, I mean, they're rhythmic you know, the way that the cicadas and frogs are, but like they're not, they're not in 3-4, they're not in 4-4, four, four, you know, they're not, they're not 
they're doing a whole other musical thing. And so, you know, I'm kind of interested in, in moving into, I hesitate to say avant-garde, you know, but it feels avant-garde to me in some ways to be like, I just want to kind of break out of these, some of these structures that I've like really stuck with for a long time. And I'm absolutely positive that's going to affect the way that I write as well. So, we'll see. Just don't stop. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I love your music, so oh, just keep you. going, please. Oh, yeah. <laughs> whatever you do, how, whatever absolutely. form it takes. Absolutely. We got, we got lots, lots more coming. Any more questions from the audience? Oh, yes. I have one for a moment. Um, you're talking about different um, edits of one piece of work, so it usually gets to like the 10th or 11th. Yeah. Um, so what's the difference between like the 9th and the 10th or the 10th and 11th? Like, you make a lot of edits, but what makes you say like it's like that? Um. There's not a whole lot of difference between the 9th and the 10th. By, the te by that time, I'm just sort of close, close to the, uh, you know, fixing small things, but uh, the, uh, from like say one to five usually, I'm uh, starting a, uh, a new blank page each time and I have my old draft there and I write real quick and, you know, um, I write it completely over about five times or so and then once I get it to a place I think is okay structurally, then um, print it out and I'll do my marks and um, then just edit one thing. Uh, and um, I'm getting closer as the marks get fewer and fewer per draft. So. That's all. Maybe you get it down to eight. Yeah. So ten, that's ten. Oh, down to eight? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, most of them are around eight. Yeah. That seems to be the average. But. We said imposter syndrome. It gets you. Yeah. It really gets you. I just, uh, I just, I just want it to be the thing that it wants to be. I guess. Um, just, you know, cutting away at that uh, rock until it makes the sculpture you had in your yeah. head. Or, that's, that's it. <laughs> Cool. Any other questions? Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Thank you. 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 Yeah, thank you. so much. Thanks for greeting me. It's the best bookstore in Remington. <laughs>